Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of What Makes You Click. I'm really pleased to be with um, my longtime friend, Debbie Horvitz. Um, put it that way. Um, I think I've known you, well, over 25 years, I think. Uh, IVBM, 1997. I, yeah, that's, that's, that was my thinking too. Um, if you don't know Debbie, um, it's possible that you don't because, uh, especially if you're not a veterinarian, because Debbie is very well known in the veterinary behaviour circuit. I'm not, I don't know, um, in, certainly in Europe, how much you've done to non-vets, uh, although lots of people will know your work. Um, but Debbie is a vet, uh, diplomat of the American College, um, has a master's in psychology, and as I said, I'm, I met you in 97. I, I've always originally thought of you as the sort of one of the original cat behavior people. Um, <laughs> I know that's funny. A lot of people say that. And um, I, I didn't know that for a long time that people associated me with cats, but. Yeah, um, but and, and I know you're interested in dogs as well. And you also have one of the greatest videos of dog behavior that I misattributed to you last time I was in the States talking. That's okay. Well, I need to tell you that I'm three credits shy of a master, so I don't really have a master. Oh, oh dear. Okay. Oh, we won't, <laughs> uh, we won't, we won't go into that. Um, hopefully nobody's listening. Um, but um, so, yeah, as I said, you've worked most of your working life. I know you're officially retired now which means that you don't pull down a, a salary from anyone on a routine basis um, but you're still very busy I think with all sorts of things um, but spent a wealth of time in practice and I think one again one of the things that really impressed me was that that didn't stop you churning out publications you have a long list of honors and appointments um, it seems that whenever you talk at the North American Veterinary Conference you go and win um, speaker of the year award which is great. Um, uh, so, you know, very popular speaker. If you don't know Debbie, I don't know if there is stuff on YouTube that they can find about you, but always worth chatting to, um, always worth listening to as well. And so welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. I mean, with the pandemic, we used to see each other a little more frequently. It's, it's been yeah. hard, but we've done some fun things together. We've done books together and, um, lectured together uh you know it's been a wonderful friendship and professional collaboration yeah oh you're so nice um i should have <laughs> had you on earlier uh i've <laughs> just been uh, getting through a list but uh yeah so you mentioned the books and you know a couple of the books that i, I mean you've edited a few of the vet clinics of north america which i think are really good there's the five minute vet consults in behavior if people aren't aware of absolutely brilliant reference texts of bullet points of stuff in behavior that can get you through an awful lot very quickly. And yes, we co-edited uh, the BSAVA manual, a couple of editions of that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with in, in relation to that. And I can't say that for all of my co-authors, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> but I won't, I won't mention any of We, we my... have the same urgency of getting it done. <laughs> yeah, I dropped my pen. Um, so, so where should we begin? I, I, well, I, I tell you where I'll start because um, I'll start with sort of, yeah, as I said, I got to know you through the sort of cat behavior work. And I think your paper on behavioral and environmental factors in house soiling cats, which came out around about the time I first met you in 97, I think it was, the paper came out. Yeah. Um, you, you actually did this study where you looked at house soiling in cats and what are the factors. And, you know, it's the first real data that pointed to things like the importance of scented litter, uh, history of medical problems, uh, especially relating to the urinary system, and also the covering behavior. And, you know, we've, I've done work since then, and I'm pretty good at jumping onto people's coattails and think, oh, well, let's see what else there is there. Um, because covering behavior we found was actually one of the better signs to focus in on. Everyone talks about with house soiling cats, oh, look at the volume. And Jackie Nielsen did a lovely study where she used diapers and said, doesn't make any difference. But the, whether or not the cat engages in the covering behavior and understanding the house soiling in terms of whether it's trying to communicate a latrine, you know, it's just so important and actually so simple if you can get 
observations. Um, so it was it was a very interesting observation to me because it was something that I thought about. And I came upon that because a lot of people tell you their cat jumps in the box, they would so they would go to the bathroom and then they jump right out again. And they didn't dig and they didn't cover. And that seemed more consistent with cats that didn't, that would were willing to eliminate outside of the box. Mm. Um, and the other thing about covering that is interesting too, is if you look at feral cats, at least some of the really early research, they cover their urine, but they don't consistently cover their stool. Mm. And I, I, you know, I have two cats now and I, I, I obsessively empty the, you know, <laughs> clean their litter boxes and um, they don't consistently cover their stool, but they always cover their urine, always like mound it way up. Yeah. No, it's interesting. We've got we've got a new cat, by the way, I, but I've closed the door so you won't get to see him. Um, first time we have had a relatively young and also a cat without musculoskeletal issues. <laughs> so we're getting used to the fact, ah, this is why people have problems with cats. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got two kittens at the same time. And I thought, you're not I had had a kitten for a long time <laughs> and two of them. Wow. But they kept each other going. Um, yeah, I do like cats a lot. But he's, he's a rescue case and he's actually been fascinating to watch because he was kept in a cage and um, as I said he's two years old. He'd been kept in Thai until about a month before we got him. Ooh. Might be a Norwegian forest or Maine Coon type, but very, very long. No breadth to him though. None of the typical male features uh, was quite, well, was quite, thin and scrawny and cognitively really um, simple. It took him, you know, a day or two to come out from underneath the sofa. And we've just, you know, as we do with our cats, we give them the time to settle in. Don't try to interfere, make sure they got the resources. We've had him, well, I think less than two months. He's now cognitively and uh, his dexterity has been absolutely fascinating to watch just <laughs> the other night. He started scooping food out of his food bowl and eating it off his paws, like a, like a chimpanzee. <laughs> and I'm thinking, where did you learn that? <laughs> so I, I find cats fascinating because so much of what they do, all cats do. Like my cat's sitting here out of view, and she's um, taking a bath. <laughs> She'll make <laughs> and <it> she's <laughs> uh, she's. You know, they all do the same this and the same that, but they have other odd things that they do, especially around feeding and perhaps maybe litter behavior that are that are unusual, that you don't expect to see. And I, I don't, um, I think that they're much more flexible behaviorally than we give them credit for. That's what I, I yeah, think. It's, it's interesting because again, one of the things that happened with him, the, the reason why I think he started eating out of his paw is because he's got one of these puzzle feed boards, which has got these little bowls and he scoops yeah. it out and usually he flicks it out. But if it lands on his pads, he will eat off his pads. But when he first came to us, and I hadn't seen this before in a cat, but he just had almost an obsessive amount of scratching on horizontal surfaces around food and whatever you know if there wasn't food in the food bowl he would go to it and then he'd just scratch around the area like with his water bowl he would just scratch around it and whatever and now that he's gained a bit of weight doesn't take long in our household um <laughs> you know that has subsided um but i think yeah partly of the confinement you know there was whether or not he'd been scratching to try and get out or anything like that um but it's just amazing how quickly he has adapted, as I said, in the two months that he's been here. That's um, great. Do you take videos? Yeah, I've actually got a video of him chittering because I, I, I don't know about you, but you can't oh, when he sees stuff. Sound. Yeah, you know, when, when he sees birds. <laughs> why, yeah. But why do they do it with birds and nothing else? What was your theory on that? I, it's it to me it's a high arousal thing and my I have bird feeders I right outside a window and I have a little a short cat tower with a lip and one of my cats sits there like this like she's watching tv and every once in a while she, she just I think it's a frustration behavior because she can't she can't get to them but, but I only see it with birds I don't see it with any of the other things that he's watching outside because he's an indoor only cat um 
And he sees well, they mine see squirrels. They don't do it with squirrels. They only do it with they only do it with the birds. Mm. But I, they maybe they would. I don't know. Yeah. Um, there are never any mice or anything small enough that they could see. Like there's a squirrel that runs across the windowsill, and they're glued there. Yeah. But they don't say anything. But the birds pretty yeah. routinely one of them chitters at them. Yeah. I yeah. I mean I seen that but I've never I've had cats that go out and hunt and I haven't been super close to them but I never heard them do it I think it's frustration because if they yeah. were really hunting they wouldn't make any noise because then well that's it away. but as I said it's just because yeah we've got squirrels as well and um doesn't do it to the squirrels no. either. all the cats that come across our right our mine, well. mine don't either but so, the birds and only one of mine really does it yeah, only one does it. The other one, rarely, if ever, does it. But they both yeah. will sit for hours. I have one, two, three, four. I like five bird feeders yeah. in two different windows and uh, three different windows, and they'll sit there all day and watch if their birds there. And if they're not there, they stalk, and then they still are surprised when they get to the window that the birds fly away. It's I, I think they are pretty sure they're invisible. Like they're stalking, they, they're going to jump on it. And then, you know, the birds can sense that something's right on the other side of the window. And, they, and they're like. We've, we've just had a new extension um, put onto the house because this is. Oh, yeah, it's cottage. gorgeous. I saw pictures. Oh, you, oh, you've seen the pictures. OK, so it's got lots of glass. So it actually sort of takes a bit of the house into the garden. It gives us nice and light. And needless to say, the cat, that's where the cat main cat tree is, etc. He gets the best room in the house. So funny the other night. Of course, <laughs> he, he was he was watching something coming across the garden, and so he started looking out of one window. Then he jumps over to the other window, then to the third window, and clearly it, it then went back towards the end of the house. So he comes running through into the living room where the TV is. There's no windows on that side. <laughs> Just looks up. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> goes back i i just find them i mean dogs can be funny but cats are often funny and, and dogs are not funny in the same way that cats are cats are surprised yeah. by things dogs don't seem to be as easily surprised but cats are you know like to run in there and go what there's no window here yeah <laughs> I'm, I know. I'm, not sure that, I'm not sure that he's learned that anyway but um so um so yeah, so going back to the cat stuff, as I said, that's sort of how I, uh, I thought about you for a long time as the, <laughs> the cat vet lady. Um, and you have you have published a lot of stuff on cats. Um, you also, I've, I've seen you do some fantastic presentations with internal medicine people on veterinary and medical aspects together. And I, 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 if ever, you know, anyone gets a chance to go to any of those sessions where they do have a both, a veterinary behaviorist and a, a veterinary internist um, talking about that interaction. The, the, the ones I've been to in North America, I think have been really, really good. Um, so, but, so what do you see as your sort of primary area of specialism then? Well, I really, really like teaching veterinarians. Um, I, they're so appreciative and um, attentive so when I'm giving the lecture, I don't like um, virtual, that more or less made me stop lecturing for the most part because I like looking at the people I'm lecturing to. And I like seeing if someone's going, yeah, 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 where they're sitting there like this. Mm. And, and if there's a lot of this, then I know that I'm not being clear. If there's a lot of this, then, then I know those I'm on the right people listening, they, they don't have a clue. And if there's doing. some of this, then I know I'm not being as clear. Um, so I get a lot of um, pleasure from teaching veterinarians and I've yeah. lectured a lot and I really enjoy it. And um, I feel very fortunate that I got hooked up with a couple of, um, of uh, companies and people who schedule lectures for companies who are very open, not only to behavior, but to that melding of behavior and medicine. And those were always fun to do because um, I learned something from them because I don't do medicine anymore, per se. And they learned something from me. And those were always really well received. And um, I really 
I just really like lecturing. I liked seeing, I liked seeing clients for a long, long time. Um, I always thought that for people to have to give up their pet for a behavioral reason was more devastating when they had to put their pet to sleep for a medical reason. Because yeah. um, medicine, it, you know, it, it happens. If your pet's really old or if your animal gets hit by a car and, and you know, it, it it's, can't be helped. And people are sad. I'm not saying they're not sad, but they understand that there are limits there. But when they have to put their pet to sleep for a behavioral reason, they always feel like it's their fault, I think. And they suffer greatly. What did I do wrong? Um, could I have saved this pet? And uh, that's what really got me into behavior is that um, I like talking to people, but when, you know, I find once behavior became a specialty, <clears throat> the number of people who came, I used to have a dog that did that, that and I had to put to sleep because there was nobody like you. <clears throat> and I found that disheartening, but gratifying at the same time, because <clears throat> we can help so many people keep their pets. And um, people are really attached to their pets and we can improve the quality of life for the people and their pets. And that's why I like seeing patients. And I've never, never thought about it like that, but that's such a good point, uh, you know, but yeah, behavioral reasons. That's what so, did it for me. So you were not grandfather, grandmothered into the American college. You had, no. you had to do it the hard way. Um, yes. I, I got the easy route in Europe because we're, we're a few years behind. Yes. You, so <laughs> I, got, I got grandfathered in without having to do the exams. <laughs> And I could have, I just was too lazy to write the case reports and do all of that. I just said, I don't need more letters after my name. I was too old at that time. Yeah, then you but did. what, hap what yeah. happened is they grandfathered in eight people. We called them the great eight. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> then that was in 1993. They gave the first exam in 1995 and they passed um, three more people. And then, um, more people five people I guess and then and I took in the 96 and three of us passed and so we I was in the sweet 16 as we called ourselves You're at that still time sweet 16. <laughs> so um yes there were there were the people who really <clears throat> they were all basically in academia <clears throat> and the, <clears throat> pardon me the rest of us had to uh do it by exam so so when did you when did you actually start doing well first of all yeah you you said you were in vet practice so when did you start getting interest in behavior at that level and then when did you switch really sort of primarily into behavior work well my age will be showing I started seeing behavior cases in 1982 um and that started after I I lived in Michigan and I went to Michigan State University, graduated there as a veterinarian in the mid to late 70s. And um, at that time, Michigan State had a program where you could go to two years undergrad and then you went three years all year round to veterinary school. Okay. So I started uh, college and went for two years and then three more years. So I, five years I was done. And somewhere I was thinking about this today because I thought you might ask. Sometime two to four years after I graduated, the American Animal Hospital Association meeting was in Detroit and Victoria Vo Voice spoke. And when I listened to her, I thought that is what I wanted to do. And I will always remember this because it influenced how I talked to people who came up and said, I want to do this. I went up and said to her, I want to do this. And um, I love Victoria. She influenced me a lot, but you get that statement a lot. And she was real, very realistic about what it would take to do that. And after that, I just started going to as much as I could and reading as much as I could. And then shortly thereafter, I started uh, a home call practice in Detroit. So uh, my kids were small. So I did, I worked part-time at a couple practices and then I did home calls for behavior on nights and weekends when my husband would be home. And um, here's, here's an interesting tidbit. When Victoria Voith had the first residency in the United States and that was at University of Pennsylvania and that residency came out um, three months after I had had my second child. 
and I wanted to apply. And my husband said, yeah, we'll make it work. I said, I really, I really don't think so. It's a lie. So I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, so who it was, was sort of a security. Who, who was Victoria's first resident? I think, I think it was Karen. Really? I didn't think she was the first. It was either Karen, Karen, it, Karen did do a residency. It was either yeah, no, Karen, Karen did a residency. But that there was the only one. Victoria's was the first. And Kathy, then Kathy had a residency, and Bonnie had a residency, and Ben had residencies. So Sharon, because Sharon was Kathy's first resident, wasn't it? Sharon Crow Davis. Right, but she wasn't a resident then. She was a PhD student. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, she was a PhD student. She was one of the ones that was grandfathered in. And um, Victoria was at University of Pennsylvania, and that was the very first residency. Then, um, and Kathy had PhD students. Uh, Alana was a PhD student. Not yeah. Kathy didn't have a residency at that time. Okay, yeah. Was, I, I I, when I visited Kathy in 89, Alana was doing her PhD. That's when, that's the first time I met. Um, right, and that Kathy. they weren't residency positions. But my, my daughter was born in 1981. So, and I think it was actually longer than three months, but I think the first residency was like in 82 or started in the July of whatever. And um, then Bonnie had a residency and um, Kathy had a residency and Ben had a residency. One time there were seven, uh, but the first yeah. ones were um, Victoria, Kathy, Bonnie, Ben, and um yeah because okay. and, and then nick and rk it's interesting you you mentioned vicky and uh vicky void because um vicky was one of the driving forces also for why i started these podcasts um, you what vicky was one of the driving forces for me starting these podcasts because oh. i was i was lecturing to our students and you know i've, I've I know how lucky I've been in meeting all of these people, getting to know them, etc. And uh, as I said, ignorance is bliss. I just sort of, we well, you know what I'm like. I meet people and we're on first name terms and whatever. And then realize everybody else is referring to them as Dr. Voith or Dr. Hout and whatever. And I'm thinking, oh, is there, am I supposed to? Um, and, that, you know, ignorance was bliss. And, you know, the, all of these people have been so welcoming to me. And I was lecturing to the students. Um, and I mentioned sort of about some of the behavior management protocols and how they'd been codified by Vic, Vic, Vicky. And the students just sort of looked at me blank and I just thought, you don't know who I'm referring to, do you? And they sort of, no. I was thinking- You know why? Well, okay, well, we'll come to that. I'll come to this, what I thought, and then you can tell me. And so I just thought that, well, you know, these protocols have become so ingrained, people have, you know, people have forgotten to credit the original source. And I know that Victoria moved away and, and she moved out for a while and then she's moved uh, back at, um, on the West Coast. And I just thought, that's not right. People don't know who these eminent people are. I've had the benefit of it. So I just thought, I'm gonna start these podcasts and just make sure that there's something said about them. <laughs> um, because yeah, you know, she, she was there when they were starting to codify behavior protocols for humans and said, well, we can apply them to animals. Well, but it's interesting because um, there has been an intense amount of misappropriation of nothing in life is free is the greatest example of that. And um, I remember early on writing an article about nothing in life is free, attributing to Victoria Voith and getting, I won't say a barrage because the internet wasn't around there, but several letters protesting that um, William Campbell really came up with it right. also. So he called it no such thing as a free lunch and she called it nothing in life is free. It has a million names. Karen overall calls it protocol for deference. Mm. I always called it doggy please. It's all the same thing. But what really changed the reference to it is um, someone who wrote a very popular book, used it and said it was hers. Who's that? Uh, the 
I don't, I don't want to get a completely different Is there thing. a book that where somebody has used nothing in life is free in the title that you can think of? <laughs> Not in the title. It's oh. in her, all her uh, videos, all the things she does. And um, when called on it and said, you know, you didn't make that up. She, she said she created it. When called on it, she said, well, I just do it differently. But it's all the same. Okay. It's basically, um, and it doesn't matter uh, what you call it. It's probably better to, um, this is, might be off topic, to talk about it and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And what you're tr trying to achieve is, from a dog particularly, attention to you so that you can direct them to desired behavior. But that's a long title. Yeah, and I think that's the thing because, uh, in fact, I was just chatting to the students this week about this, that you know, people talk about nothing in life is free and then some people just took it to such an extreme that it became right. really quite punitive for the, the, for the dogs. And sort of that, that's not how it was intended. And I was explaining how, you know, if you think about some of the exercises we do to control impulsivity, in effect, you're taking elements of nothing in life is free, but Correct. in a particular context to try and teach that skill. Um, and yeah, so, and then, I mean, that, I think that's what led Kathy Sadeo to write the book, Plenty in Life is Free, because it had been completely hijacked, I think, and misrepresented as so much yes, it, 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 it was meant to be um at least in my interpretation and how i use it a placeholder in a way for saying i know you're thinking of doing this but do this instead and when i ask you to do this this is what i want you to do and once you learn how to do that the idea of doing it in multiple circumstances is once the dog learns how to do it when you ask them to do in a circumstance that's more challenging, you're likely to get that behavior because it's become more habitual. So the idea really, and I don't know that we always took the time to explain it, is instead of saying, stop that, it could be, look at me, sit. Mm -hmm. And it, it starts with nothing in life is free by asking the dog before things they want per se to request them to respond to a cue, not in a punitive way, not withholding what they want, but when they're more motivated to do it. And then you can ask them to do that same thing at other times. And you hopefully are evoking a response in the dog say, oh, I know that. Good things happen when I do that. It calms me down when I do that. There's nothing punitive about it. The whole mm -hmm. goal is for the animal to say, I, I know that. Yeah. I understand that. And I mean, one of the sort of, uh, well, representations of it, which I quite liked early on, um, Kendall Shepard sort of sort of talked about it as sort of, well, what you're trying to do is you're, you're creating a wall and the owner is the gatekeeper that allows you to get through that wall. And it's, it's you know, and that, and I think that's quite a, a nice way of um, sort of representing it rather than, as I said, it, it, it got, I think, completely out of hand. Yes. People were just, you know, and there's, it's one of the things I find fascinating, you know, there's so many exercises that can be, um, you know, we don't know exactly what the dog is learning or the cat is learning when we do them. Right. We can have our own theories for this, that and the other. And, you know, you can put whatever framework. Um, we're just starting now to do a few trials where we're starting to try and tease out some of those more subtle things to see whether or not well okay if you do this exercise what is the animal actually learning and if you do I don't it like to way... think of it as a wall actually because a wall is punitive I like to think of okay. it as a pause yeah as a okay. pause uh, you know it, um, I, I mean I understand what Kendall's getting at but I think when people think of it as a wall it's like a hard stop okay um, but what I'm thinking of is let's you know, just like yeah. we said, take a breath. I don't want to argue with you. Yeah. Take a breath. And so for some owners and their pets, owners don't know how to let their dog take a breath. Mm. And the dog doesn't know how to stop the behavior sequence that they're about to do. So if we ask them to take a breath in a benign circumstance with something that they kind of want, not denying them their food, they don't have to sit forever. I don't as long as they touch their bottom to the floor, we go, wait, 
Hooray, go eat. Mm. The idea being, I can get you to take a pause. Yeah. I can get you to take a pause. And parents do it, but in a punitive way, sometimes they go, look at me. They grab yeah. the kid's face and they go, look at me. But um, really what you want is for the animal to trust you to pause. Mm. And see, when... See, that's how we use it in relation to impulse control. In so much as, yeah, we, but we, well, it, partly. No, it, it so is much that. behavior we don't like in dogs yeah. is lack of impulse control. Yeah, absolutely. If, if they just pause, they'll make good decisions. And if you can teach them that, then, you know. But they're dogs. Get easy life. I, I think dogs are predisposed to make, it, Alana Reisner once said something to me, and I use it a lot, and it's outdated the way I use it. I've, I'll tell you how I update it. She once said, if the dog has a Rolodex in their brain, all the cards are labeled dog. They only have dog <laughs> behaviors. That's all they're going to do. So now I say, if a dog has a contact list in their brain, because nobody knows what a Rolodex is, but it's a good way to look at things because <clears throat> dogs can only do dog stuff. That's all they're capable of doing. And so we want to put certain dog stuff under verbal control so that we can redirect them in a benign way to stop their very worst dog impulses. Yep, no, that, that's good. I, I think that's a <laughs> very neat way of doing it. Also reminds me, I ought to ask Ilana to do one of these. Um, catch up with her at some point. Yeah. Um, I'll come, come back to that. Um, so, just picking up on what you said before and, and sort of in relation to that, because this is what I love about chatting to people is that they give you new ways of thinking about things and new thoughts as well. Um, and you, you mentioned how much you love uh, lecturing to vets and, and how, uh, you know, losing a pet because of a behavior reason is probably more troubling for an owner than uh, for a medical reason. Um, so what do you think are, uh, given all the experience that you've got, what do you think are the most important messages for, yeah, the general vet in practice to know about behavior? Because I'm always fascinated by this because I am, I do feel very removed from that world, not being in a vet school, being in academia and the right. sort of research that I do. Um, and so people like yourself who are still, I mean, I, I still see clients. Um, and so, you know, I have that. Um, contact with clients but actually knowing what vets in first line opinion work are seeing uh, it's such a different world to me now and I'm just intrigued what you think are the most important lessons nowadays that vets should should really get to grips with it's evolved for me over time mm. but in the last 10 15 years I have focused on the most important things for veterinarians to know is they know a lot about dog behavior. So they think everybody knows it and pet owners don't. Pet owners are gonna own one to five dogs in their lifetime. Some people own more, but most people only own one, two or three. Mm -hmm. Veterinarians handle dogs every single day. They know, and what I, this is exactly what I say in my lectures. If you have four fingers and a thumb on each hand, you know a lot about dog behavior. You just don't know how to label it. So you don't know how to talk to people about it. So I encourage them when they walk, like <clears throat> I raise my hand and I say, when was a, who was bitten in the last month? No one hand, the last year, no hand, the last two years, maybe one or two. I said, how many of you, when you were bitten, just before you were bitten, you went, oh no, because you knew it was gonna happen, right? Pet owners never know that. They never know what's gonna happen. If you're able to handle dogs without being bitten on a regular basis, you know a lot about dog behavior. You just don't recognize it as unusual. But we are unusual. We love dogs. We love cats. We watch them. And our livelihood depends on having four fingers and a thumb on each hand. So we know when we're going to be bitten or mm -hmm. scratched or hissed. And so my lectures focus on, see this? This is what I call it. This is the precursor to the bite. When you're doing something with your pet, you walk in the room, you stop, you turn sideways. Don't just do it. Say, Mrs. Jones, I can see that Fred's a little upset. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to look at you and not look at him. Give him a minute to calm down. See how his body's relaxed, his ears have dropped down. The veterinarian knows all that, but they don't label it. So if I can say there's one important thing that I tell veterinarians, it's that. 
that has become a big focus of my lectures, that they know a lot about behavior, they just don't think it's important. That's, 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 that's brilliant. Um, it sort of reminds me, because when I first joined the university, um, I, used, I had an animal learning and training module that I used to run. And the thing I really struggled with was how to instruct students on certain aspects of training. And it made me realize that, you know, I, I wasn't aware of what it was, was that I was doing around dogs that was making them do what they do. And, and my mum used to tell the story that when I was sort of just over two, apparently I was riding the Cocker Spaniel. Uh, so clearly, you know, and dog unfortunately ended up being put to sleep for biting somebody probably because of a bad back with me lying over it. But clearly, you know, I'd grown up youngest of five kids. My two brothers would play with each other. My two sisters would play with each other. So I had the dogs to play with. And yeah, it you just know, is an affinity. There's some of us who have an affinity. Do you, most dogs and cats like you, don't they? I hope so. Uh, and you know so. Yeah. I mean, there's some that you know are too dangerous that you don't yeah. try and, and broach that. Yeah. But um, it's it's if you're a good veterinarian and you love your job, there's something about the way you approach animals that is unique. Just like horse people. Yeah, you know? I mean, I was going to say that my father, when he was in practice, there was a blacksmith that he, who was actually the um, godfather of one of my brothers. If my father had a difficult horse, he'd bring in this blacksmith and he just knew how to calm the horse down. And I'm convinced it was all about his body language and whatever. And he yes. has this sort of languid movement, very smooth, etc. And the horses just flow with it. I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm jittery all over the place, which is great at getting dogs' attentions to focus on me. And so they then respond to me and I can communicate with them. And that I, 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 so that is, that is, I mean, those are my favorite lectures to give. And I, those I'll give all the time. I don't want, I don't like to lecture about drugs and I can lecture on training techniques or whatever, but I think what I love talking to veterinarians about aggression, just because if they can learn how to, they know how to recognize it. They don't know how to talk about it. So, so I'm, I mentioned in the intro uh, that you have one of the greatest videos I think there is of dog behavior, which, oh, I, misattributed to, which I misattributed to Kathy, but you put me right. Um, Jericho, the dog. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I wanted to see if it's, I mean, because, well, it must have been you that gave it to me, but I, I, for some reason I confused it with Yeah, I Kathy. did. I, yeah. I passed it around to a lot of veterinarians. I, might, uh, I know the owners really well. They just got a new dog. They sent their new dog to me. Yeah and said they just took a picture. They sent me a picture and said he just won a training award as a young puppy. And you and Jericho taught us so much because now we know what to do. And they were both veterinarians. Oh, wow. So, so that's, I mean, so for people who don't know the video, cause it's not on YouTube. Um, no, if somebody put it up there and I tracked them down and made it take it down. Okay. My, yeah. my clients yeah. actually don't care. But what people misinterpret about it is dangerous. So I won't allow it up there. Yeah. But just, just so people listening, whatever, are aware, it, it is this video of uh, this dog that is in the vet clinic and the technician comes in and this dog is issuing so many signs saying, I'm uncomfortable here. And the technician- And he's in a tight space. He's in he can't tight move. Space, uh, you know, and, and you can record, you know, all the things, the puffing of the uh, lips, the blinking, the eyes, um, he yawns, he approaches, cocks his leg, you know, everything to try and get the technician to back off and she doesn't. And then finally he issues an air snap. And, and you know, people say, oh, you know, wow, what a dangerous dog. And I said, no, this is a safe dog. This dog right. knows how to warn you, you know? I, I don't know if you know this, the, um... The dog had done this to the technician before and they were worried about that. So they set her up and took the video so I could see it. Oh, wow. I know, wow. what a great technician. Wow. So when they opened okay. up, and this that's, is a long- That's, that's worth knowing, because when I show this video to the students, I will have to let them know that because- you know, Yeah, they don't, they so just it's think... a repeatable behavior that, and again, makes wow. the dog more reliable. So <clears throat> it's one of those big video cameras, they flip it open, I look at the beginning of the video and my first thought is, oh, expletive, <laughs> this is not going to end well. 
Yeah. Because I was as shocked as the next person at the ending because the dog shows an infinite amount of patience and bite inhibition and everything. And when you know that it's the second time and you know the treatment we did for that dog, you know. No. Oh, okay. So Jericho's problem was that he didn't know how to extricate himself when he wasn't comfortable. And his owners couldn't tell that he wasn't comfortable as per that video. So what we taught Jericho was to go, that his owner was gonna say to him, and we start with people he knows and likes, Jericho, let's go say hello. And she'd walk him up and ask him to sit. They'd give him a treat and she'd go, come on Jericho, let's go. So the whole exercise probably took under a minute. We never had to stay. So first with unfamiliar people, then with, I mean, familiar people, less familiar. Finally, she called me and said, I'm so proud of my dog. I said, what do you do? She said, I, I said, Jericho, let's go say hello. And he didn't move. So I left. And it, it's that when I talk about the pause, we gave Jericho a chance to understand what was going to happen when he, let's go say hello. I've used that many times. Let's go say hello to people the dog knows and he wants to do it and he gets a treat. And he knows that let's go say hello means I'm getting closer to you. And Jericho said, well, I don't want to get closer to that person. And they had, and so they left. And after that, over time, Jericho could greet anybody. Every once in a while, he would say no. Yeah. Um, and that's such an important skill to, yeah, to teach owners that it's okay for your dog to say no sometimes. Right. You know, and you, you want to set things up so that, yeah you have that opportunity. That's uh, why I put a lot of emphasis with so many owners about the importance of having a safe haven. Because if your dog's in the safe haven, you say walkies, if he stays in there, he's saying, no thanks, not tonight. And you respect that and you just, you know. And I think we need to talk more about dogs having a safe walking haven. They don't need to say hello to every dog. They don't, and, and that is another, I mean, there's so many things that were frustrating to me in practice because of this assumption that dogs should do all these things, which I think are um, difficult asks for dog. They should greet all the dogs they meet. They should greet all the people they meet. They should go to crowded spaces, bark in the park, the balloon race, all these, they should go to all these places. And I always said to clients, I don't wanna go everywhere. Do you wanna go everywhere? And we have to allow the dogs to say no, and the owners understand their dog's personality and say, okay, I, my dog doesn't want to do this. I, th I think you're absolutely spot on. It's something we've started to look at actually over the last few years is, uh, yeah, dog dog greetings and, and actually what people think of as a socialized dog. And I, I wonder actually if it's a bit of the fallout of, you know, the, the growth of socialization. And I think there's, there's, whilst that's a very positive thing there's been a few negative things one of which is as you say this idea that if my dog is socialized he can and he will go everywhere and he will be bomb proof and i just think that's unrealistic you know yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> as charming as you are um <laughs> uh, and the second thing is and this is something which i've sort of seen more recently is this idea that when dogs meet other dogs some owners and it's, it's not all owners by any shot but there's there's a, a a fair number of owners who think that dogs should just go off and play well actually i don't you know no the dog should greet and then you know we'll ask whether or not it's okay to go off and play you know same way as if well, I meet somebody, you know, they, I expect them to tell me if they're leaving the house so that I don't lock them out at midnight or something, you know? But when your kids were little kids, they met kids on the playground that they went up and down the slide with. And other kids, when they started going down the slide, they said, no, I don't want to go up and down the slide with you. When they went to the swings, yeah. right? We allow them to have that freedom. The last dog I owned was a Westie. And I got him when he was eight. And, and I never, when you're walking your dog, it's hard to video. He was the best dog greeting dog I'd ever owned. He would stand, he was a Westie, so he had his ears up, his tail up. He would let himself be sniffed from head to tail more than once. 
And then he wanted to sniff the other dog and then he was done. He didn't want to play. So if a dog tried to jump on him, he would go. Rawr. And so after a few people saying, your dog's mean, Oscar and I got a shorthand. He would be <clears throat> sniffed and he would sniff and I'd say, come on, Oscar, let's go. And we left. Because Oscar was not interested in, of, of playing with other dogs. He yeah. loved sniffing other dogs. He loved letting them sniff him. But I, I knew his expectation was, I have no desire to play with you, you stupid golden doodle. Stop jumping on me. You know, that was how he looked at it. <clears throat> and I think, I, I, you asked what I think vets should know. I think what people should know is we don't love everything. Why do our dogs have to love everything? I don't like to, I won't go to a rave. I won't go to a- uh, uh, Love to see you there. Uh, <laughs> you, you can see me there. Um, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's some things I don't, I don't want to go yeah. to a big crowded area or whatever. Other dogs like it. Some dogs don't leave your dog home. And it's, I don't understand that why people, even if you tell them that, they, they insist that their dog should go. Can you do some research on that for me? They don't, they seem to assume that their dog has the same wants, needs, and perspectives on social events that they do. And some dogs do, but other dogs just don't. That's, that's neat. I, it, it does trigger some ideas and outside of this call, we'll catch up and um, <laughs> I, I will be able to do some research on that. because I, it, it, I think there are ways that we could actually start to look at that, that whether or not, yeah, people who, well, how do you think, and, and this, is, this is just wild speculation, you know, one of the things with social media is people just surround themselves with individuals who um, have the same interests as them. Oh, and, you know, if, if you don't if like doing this, I'm going to unfriend you, boom. And maybe they're sort of projecting that onto their dogs as well, that their dogs should have exactly the same interests as them. Um, they're dogs why should they have the same interest as them well just because people have been reinforced through social <laughs> media that every, the people they hang about with are, are so similar and maybe that's you know and i, I, I agree but with you I think dogs aren't people dogs are no, dogs and, I, absolutely, and, and I, absolutely i agree with you I, I may ask you to to um to cut this but i have this <laughs> really strong belief that um we do a disservice to dogs when we think of them as our children as Absolutely. someone who has three children and seven grandchildren, my grandchildren did things when they were little that they stopped doing because they grow mature. Dogs stay at a certain level. They are not people. Yeah, and I, I they, can't do all, they, they can't do all these people things. So if you think of them as your children, that's okay. I, I think of my pets as family. But I know, for example, I had painting done at my house. I, one of my cats is an escape artist. I got to lock her up. If there's a door left open, she's gone, mm -hmm. all right? It, I think she should under, the other cat, no desire to go out the door, it's dangerous out there. I lock them both up, why? Because they're cats and they do cat stuff, which is escape. Well, I, don't, I, so, I agree with you 100%. And, and I think, you know, just to reiterate the point that you made in case people have lost, there is no problem with considering animals as part of your family, but don't consider them as your kids, you know, yeah. They are different, yeah? Uh, They're different. That, that's why I don't like the term pet parent, actually. Oh my gosh. I've always loved you, Danny, but this now it's it's like overwhelming. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't like that either because having been a parent and also a grandparent, my expectations are that they're going to grow up and become adults. And dogs, you can, I don't know. I just, I don't like the term. I, well, as I said, I think you're doing a disservice because you're not appreciating how wonderful it is for a dog to be a dog. You know, I'm with or you, hundred percent. Yeah, no. What I love most about dogs is their dogginess. That yeah, every absolutely. time you come home, it's like you're here again. <laughs> you know, if I if I want more kids, I can adopt them. You know, <laughs> um, you know, and and that's fair enough. And equally you know it's unhealthy because if you know if somebody sees a pet as a substitute for a child a you know I, I think they're potentially going to be left unfulfilled 
and b they're just not giving the dog the chance in the same way as the person who loses a dog immediately gets another dog to replace it calls it the same name and everything and then before you know it they're saying well he's not the same as my old billy no he's not he's a new dog and you've called him billy right. and he, he right. can't fill that gap right um uh, it's a quite interesting and you know I, what here's something off topic sort of but about cats because people um often get another cat when the long companion dies right hmm. and those two cats were bonded to each other and what i used to say might have to cut this too. What I used to say was, I've been married to my husband for 40 years at the time I would say that. And if something happened to him, I wouldn't want someone just to go out and get me another man and bring him home. He was the one I was attached to, just like two cats are attached to each other. And I can't, I, you know, I could use that, but it seems sort of- I thought that's what you lined me up for. <laughs> I did, but you're married. <laughs> no. Uh, I don't think your wife would approve. Yeah, you're besides probably. you're a little too, you're a little <laughs> depends too what day, it depends what day it is actually she might be. well yeah on any <laughs> given day uh, I, i've been married i was married 44 years on any given day yes i could replace him but uh you're too you're too young for me dan it's 30 years this year i've been married uh yeah. that i mean we're getting there i like to be married yeah um no that, that that's uh that that's really good so i mean and that's one of the other things that sort of a number of your articles, you know, they are, well, there's the book Decoding the Dog. So, so that right. I think really links in with this whole idea of your interest, but right. your articles are, yeah, they're so pragmatic or and there's several you've called, you know, common sense guide to this, that, and the other. Right. Um, and again, it's something I really admire in individuals. And I know, you know, I'd, I'd love to be, I mean, you know, yeah, I'd love to have that skill. I'm, I, I'm fascinated by fine details, etc. And I sometimes find it hard to step over that line into what is actually important. I like, I like making people think. Um, That's and, why we wrote good books together. Yeah. That That's, is why we wrote good books together because you're you're very um, academic and and very detailed, and I like the analogies and the big picture and. Um, I, I like the details, but I like breaking them down for someone else who can say, oh, that's what that detail means, because um, sometimes you get lost in the weeds. I'm not saying that you actually do, but that was mm. that's why I felt we had a great collaboration was because um, you have a lot of data in your head. And I was able to say, yes, but how would you tell that to someone mm. who doesn't understand it at all? And together, I thought I thought we did two wonderful uh, things. Yeah, I mean, I loved I, I loved editing them with you. We have to do something else together. Um, not, not, I, not quite as long term, but yes, I would no, work with you uh, always. Find something. To do with you. <laughs> um, so one of the other things I wanted to chat to you about. You, you're right for time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so. The other thing I wanted to chat to you about was separation-related problems in cats. Mm. So, you know, this is an area that um, I've had, uh, I've done some work in, and I have certain opinions. Uh, you think it's a yes or no question? Well, what? Well, cats, I think, can have separation-related problems. Whether how important attachment is in relation to separation related problems, I think is a very different question. And that's where, you know, when I look at separation related problems in cats, in fact, before we did the stuff that we've been doing in recent years on dogs, when I looked at the signs and, you know, the, the work that Stephanie Schwartz had done, I was thinking these are just frustrated cats. And, you know, the data we're getting from dogs seem to indicate that if you take, once the dog is left alone, many of the signs that you see are more related to frustration. Yes, the dog can be anxious in anticipation of the departure of the owner, but actually they're not nervous, etc. There's the exception of things where you've got uh, association with noise fears with being left alone. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of a, a potted introduction to my view of separation related problems in cats. And I just wondered what your thoughts were in relation to that. Well, number one, when it comes, to, I have these two cats now, and um, 
I am, was never a proponent of leaving cats home alone and having somebody come in once a day. I think that cats are social and um, especially if they're used to social interaction. And um, while it's an N of two, whenever I go away, I do board my cats, unless I can have someone come in my house and stay with them, which I don't have someone like that now. And when I come home and bring them home, they are not markedly changed. But over the last two months, I've gone away for long weekends, four days. And I was able only to get someone to come in once. And they were confined in a certain area in the house, bigger than where they are in, in the kennel. And when I came home, they were um, more anxious about that situation than they were about being in the kennel. So when I think of attachment in cats, I think it has something to do with how much social interaction they're expecting. And I know where I take them now, um, they're, they're Devon Rex, they're very cute, they're very social. Put them in a big, they call it paradise. You know, it has a, it has a tower, it has a, window, they're only in a cat room. They don't see any dogs, they're not with any dogs. They can't hear any other dogs. And since they were kittens, I've taken them to be boarded on a semi-regular basis. Every couple of months, maybe two days, maybe a week here, maybe four days. They're used to that. They were not used to being left home alone for days at on end with very little human contact. That seemed, and I use the Feel Away Optimum, which mm -hmm. I have in my house all the time. And that seemed to bother them more. On the other side, I moved into place, had a lot of renovations. Every day I had to confine them because like I said, they escaped. That didn't bother them. They still, when I say, come on girls, want your cookies. They follow me downstairs. I put them in their room. So the treats on the floor, they know they're coming out soon. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, do cats have separation um, distress? Um, I think it, it depends on how enriched their, their life is the rest of the way. Do, are they frustrated? I think, you know, the more I've, separation anxiety cases and dogs that I've dealt with, I do think there, I think there were likely more frustration in the beginning that when it's unmet, I mean, it, it, think of people, if your frustration's unmet, it mm -hmm. makes you more anxious and uh, changes your behavior. So I, I kind of agree that in some, some instances, it just starts at frustration. I'm not expecting mm -hmm. you to be gone for a long period of time. Yeah. No, I'm not expecting to not have things to do. Um, and, and just to clarify things, you know, whilst I, you know, I have my questions about when we talk about attachment in and going back to me sort of as the academic attachment in the in the sort of scientific sense i have no doubt yet that cats form bonds and as you say they're quite they they vary enormously in their sociality i think um and uh the, you know i think there's quite a few papers that increasingly we're finding that dimension of cat personality and there's a difference between having a cat that's been socialized to sociality going back to what we were talking about with dogs as well you know you can have a socialized dog but he can um uh you know he can be over exuberant um and actually a well socialized dog should be one that you know accepts other dogs but doesn't necessarily want to go off and play with them the whole time and that's right um, and likewise with cats uh, as i said sociality is a dimension there are clearly some cats that like to hang around with other cats Oh, there we go. <laughs> Got one. Well, I'll, tell, I'll give you an example of my cats. Um, they're siblings, but I got one first and then the other. And the sociality, this one that's right here, this is <laughs> Isabella. She is very lap sitting on anyone who comes. She gets locked in places. And um, my other cat, Nikki, gets upset. I may not know that Bella's locked in and Nikki is yowling all over the place to find her. If Nikki is locked up, Bella doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she doesn't help me find Nikki. Bella will go by the door. Nikki might be in there not crying, but that's just where she is. She's closed behind the door. 
Nikki could be somewhere crying where I don't hear her, and Bella's like, eh. So who came first, Nikki or Bella? Nikki. All right. Nikki came first. Mm. Um, and it's interesting. Um, I got Nikki at eight weeks because I have all these grandchildren. And I wanted them to be around her really young. I didn't want, they, she wanted to keep them until they were 11 or 12, which I felt was too late. And she's really great with all my grandchildren. I didn't have enough, a lot of adult visitors. So she's somewhat wary of adults. Bella was raised in a house with a lot of adults and she loves everybody. And she actually loves my grandchildren too. She's just, um, she's a cat of the variety. This might be one too, but I had a one cat who her philosophy of life was mild abuse by children is better than no attention. So abuse me, dress me up, put me in the carriage, carry me around like this because it was attention. And Bella's like that. Nikki is like, I like my attention a certain way. Yeah, that's fair enough. And again, it, that's about appreciating animals for who they are as right. individuals. And I think that's, you know, that is, well, that's at the heart of why we end up in problem behavior work because every individual is an individual. And, you know, every other client says, well, I've always treated all my dogs or cats the same. Why is right. this one different? Because it's a different individual. I don't know that cats want to live with a lot of other cats. I'm not clear on that. I've never owned more than two cats at once, so I no, can't I think, say. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, generally, yeah, mm -hmm. the same with dogs. I don't think that they particularly necessarily want big groups. Um, no. And it, it's interesting that, you know, the work done on feral dogs indicates that you can have a group of dogs that live in a certain area and they don't actually group very often. They group no. when there's a threat. And that's when numbers are important that actually right. you know if there's if there's two or three barks then and there's four of you that live in the same area if you come together and you've got more barks going on right then that prevents problems um right so if, if resources are rich yeah you know it's nice to have social contact um but on your own terms and i think that's you know goes for people it goes for dogs cats and whatever <laughs> the numbers that there are but, uh, okay, hit me. One more question. I can take two more questions. I'm just kidding. Two more questions. No, I'm um, just kidding. Whatever. Oh, where do we go? Um, well, okay. I have to bake a cake today. My daughter-in-law's birthday is tomorrow. I promised her a chocolate cake. So I have is to your bake birthday cake. coming up soon? I have a big birthday coming up soon. And I you probably know what it is. I'm not ashamed I, of my I, I don't. I don't know what it is. Um, you don't? No. You said I'm going to be big, 70. You're going to be 70 congratulations enjoy thank you yeah I, I you know it's a it's a milestone I, yeah. you know i have a father-in-law who's 101 and a half so i hope i live I knew, that one. yeah well and i knew you well a year or so ago you told me that you had a, your father-in-law was turning 100 100 he was going to yeah. be 100 and now he's 101 wow. he's just recovering from covid he's fine i mean Jeez. i know it's like we call him the Energizer Bunny in our family. <laughs> that's good. That that's good on him. Um, so, so actually, you're not that much older than me. Then you're only fourteen years older than me. That's not <laughs> it depends bad. on what time of life. Yeah, when yeah, I was fourteen, okay. you were a baby, but now yeah. not much. Yeah. So you were eighteen, you and, I was, and I was starting like infant school. But uh, uh, we probably wouldn't have got on then. But <laughs> but um, it's not that much different. Um, so in your in your retirement in inverted commas um you know you have the freedom to do what you want to do um which aspects of behavior have you wanted to keep on and uh, keep going with and which aspects have you let go for some reason i can't let go of downloading all sorts of articles that come across my feed, you know, I get all those feeds. Yeah. And, oh, that's interesting. And I, and I keep them. It's like, what are you going to use these for? But every once in a while, you know, something comes up and I go, oh, well, you need this article. I, so mm -hmm. that, that still intrigues me. The literature still intrigues me. Um, I like lecturing to veterinarians. I don't want to go to any big conferences anymore. I don't, it's, they're just, unple they're just not pleasant to me anymore. Part of that has to do with when I would go, all, 
there was a whole generation of like Gary Landsberg. Gary and Lan Landsberg and I lectured together. I TNTC, you know, too numerous to count. Mm -hmm. um, and so you always had somebody that you were with. So many of the companies I worked with, I knew the people who were at these big meetings, and I had colleagues and friends that I would see. And a lot of those people were around my age, and they're retiring, so it's not as much fun anymore. Mm -hmm. The pandemic came and put a stop to all of that. And then I realized I don't really, I miss speaking from time to time. I don't miss the going and doing. That part, I, you know, getting to the places and uh, uh, whatever. Um, I don't, I, I don't miss, I like talking about behavior, but I don't miss seeing clients. Like I told you at the beginning, before we started recording, what got me out of practice is that, at least in the circumstance and situation where I live, um, people were adopting dogs in particular that had many um, behavioral disorders that made them difficult to live with. And these people were trying really hard and they were in crisis when they would come. Uh, it's been, it's been 10 years since I stopped seeing patients. Part of that, I had a resident. So I was seeing patients, but not primary clinician. And things have changed and not changed. We've gotten better. We have in better ways of doing practice because most people now have um, a trainer that helps them do that. But we still see people in, I just couldn't handle any more of people's crises. There were dogs that, especially dogs, that what, what I wanted to say to them is that this will never be the dog you really want. And that made me sad. And I didn't want to mm -hmm. have to do that anymore. And that was, I think, a culmination of years and years and years of um, the sadness that grew in me of um, people wanting to be able to hug their dogs, kiss their dogs, have their dogs out when people come over take them for a walk without having to cross the street and do this and do that. And um, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with that, that emotional crisis they were in anymore. It was enough. It's, in, uh, it's interesting because, I mean, we, we mentioned earlier and I, I, the clients that I had yesterday, I, again, you know, and this is something I commonly say to my clients is, yeah, you know, we're talking about the importance of being an individual, but, um, you know, whilst you've come to us, with these problems we want you to not see it as a problem we want to see it as a learning opportunity and you will learn so much about dogs not just this dog and your understanding of this individual will be so much better as a result of this experience and to try and turn that away and that, that, that is something which i feel you know again it's, it's that i'm not a great one as you know for the politically correct use of language but it's about how we use language though is really important and if you frame something as a problem it's a burden and i've no doubt that you know as we say you know the, the problems do put a heavy uh, weight on people. most of you these were aggressive that. dangerous dogs they were dogs that i would never live with in my house yeah and and that they had expectations they were going to be able to do things with this dog that were never going to be possible Part of that has to do with where I live. Uh, part of that has to do with things have changed, but sources of dogs around here that are home to people, first time dog owners. It, these were dogs that were way off normal. Mm. More at that, by the end of the time I was seeing cases, that was, um, they were not normal. They mm. were really not normal. And um, am I saying I gave up? Um, I'm saying I didn't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I think my colleagues are doing a really good job with that. And now in the intervening 10 years, we know so much more about psychopharmacology that helps a great deal, these mm -hmm. dogs. But um, I, I just didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fair enough. You know, um, you know, it's like that oncologist who said, that's it, I have enough yeah. of treating cancer patients. I mean, and it's, it, if you were to ask Amy, who was, Amy Pike was my resident, she would tell you that um, there were sources of dogs here 
that when people walked in with this dog and you, you knew where they got it from and they were never gonna have a relationship with a dog that um, was the one they wanted, yeah. was fulfilling. Yeah. Uh, no, no that, and, that's fair. That's a fair comment. And, uh, but I'm, I'm sorry to hear you're not gonna be going to many conferences, but then when I retire, then I'll come and I can, I have more freedom to travel and come and visit. Well, I, I, there are places I would go, but I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's I've been to Las Vegas a dozen times. It holds no work for me. <laughs> and yeah. neither does Orlando. Um, I would do certain programs in conjunction with certain people, but to be on a general program and, mm. um, you know. Yeah. I, I, I think sort of what you're saying is it's nice to do if you're not just, it, there is the buzz of obviously teaching others, but it's nice to do it with somebody else and get something new out of it yourself as well. I'm, but I'm sort of 10 years ahead of you in that lecturing in yeah. a way. Yeah. I mean, I, I've lectured lots of places. I've been to, to NABC a dozen times, mm. Western Veterinary Conference, state meetings. I, I mean, the and nice I've thing been about to, Orlando is that it's in the middle of our winter here. So it's nice to get a bit of winter sun. if you get it Yes. Us. Yeah. I mean, there, there are nice things about Orlando and the people who attend it are great attendees. Mm. I just, and I've always gotten a great reception the last time I was there. And this is what I miss. I was walking down the street at night and some was walked towards me and went, Dr. Horowitz, you're back. Are you lecturing here? I said, yes, I am. She went, woohoo, and she kept on walking. And, and you know, I miss, I do miss that. I do miss that, but um, you know, there are good lectures out there. There are people who are, uh, and I don't know, I do a little, I do a little. It depends who invites me and where it is. That is my thing. Yeah. And I won't do virtual. So this past two years, that's been the big thing. They've asked me to do virtual. I, I, I just, I need to see someone's face. Yeah, let me see what they're, but yeah. It, yeah, it is, it is very reinforcing when you yeah, have a good crowd. Well, and that's, that's the way I've always lectured, so. There's that. that. That said, I mean, for our students, uh, lockdown has taught me different ways. And I've put a lot of my stuff as pre-records and I actually spend the lecture time with the students discussing the content, which actually I really, really enjoy. And yeah. now that we're back in front of students, I'm continuing to give them the pre-records and have the discussions. And it's really great to right. have it in the classroom than online. Um, so, you know, I think in future that's, you know, certainly within the university I'll be doing more of that but yeah I'm, I'm starting to get my traveling boots on again I've got a few things lined up this year I'm actually going abroad for the first time next month in where are you going going to Azerbaijan Ooh. um the, the the main reason is it's not it's not for work although there's one bit of work which is I want to get to some of the villages you know around the areas where they think cats might have been domesticated just to get some pictures um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go to that area. But my youngest son is, um, he's off next week, actually, he's going to the court because he's going to Armenia and um, uh, to Georgia. And I said, well, if you can extend your stay, I'll meet you out in Azerbaijan once I've finished examining the students. Um, and so we're going to just chill a bit. And then, yeah, later on in the summer, I'm, I've got some appointments with more academic ones. I've never Ooh, been yeah. to Russia or Asia. To, I've been to Japan, I guess, yeah. to speak. And um, I've been, and I still am a little bit reluctant to, to travel. I don't really, yeah. I'm in the higher risk COVID mm. age group. I don't really want to yeah. get COVID. I, I mean, I've, I've been to Russia a couple of times now, once or twice. I can't remember, it's once or twice. Um, and, um, it was really bizarre and they're lo lovely people um uh but of all the places that i have been to russia was the place where i felt there was there was the biggest disparity between individuals you know the country of communism was the least equal society so they gave me a translator while i was there 
and she sort of asked what I wanted to do on some of the times when I wasn't lecturing and I said oh you know it'd be nice to go to the Kremlin but she gets tickets to the Kremlin or to the space uh, um, exhibition and it was around about the time of the Gagarin um, anniversary going into space well we turn up and there's this long queue she says oh just come with me she goes to the front of the queue I have this British professor with me we need to come in whatever and they just let us in we just queued her. yeah professor of veterinary behavior why are you letting him in <laughs> why do I get <laughs> preference so you're a professor it, it, it was true come on yeah but it was just that whole um yeah you know you think of things being equal but it's just sort of I've never been so privileged perhaps as when I was in Russia but I really, felt that way in Japan I, I loved being in Japan yeah no I, I, I love it. Japan as well I want to go to Japan during the spring I'd love to see the blossoms in Japan yeah yeah um, I mean there so that's sort of on my agenda to do traveling I always traveled a lot. Eugene and I traveled a lot. I have a friend I've known, like she's a longtime friend. I've known her since I was 12. And uh, <laughs> we have some travel lined up. So, you know, I've sort of reached the point where I would speak and travel. But now, why don't I just travel? If yeah. someone invites me to speak somewhere, maybe. But, um, you know, I've been, I don't know. I don't know. I well, never say fun. never. If you find yourself in the UK, there's a space for you here. You know that. Oh yeah, I really, I, I haven't been back to the UK in a long time and I never um, really did uh, the Lake District and, all, and, and so oh. that my friend and I were saying, ah, that, I think we want to do that, but we'll take the train, we won't drive. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about three, well, from where we are, it's about three, three and a half hours. So as I said, if you want to, you can do it on the train. But um, yeah, the, okay. the lakes are beautiful. They really are. But uh, I'd like to do that. And what's your new cat's name? Mika. He came with the Mika? name. Mika. Mika. He came with the name. So I actually heard him outside the door a few minutes ago. But uh, this is one of the rooms he's not allowed in. But uh, yeah, well, my other my other cat's sleeping. She's I don't know where she is, but Bella's right here. Bella, my cats are cold. This Bella's cold all the time. So she sleeps on the cable TV box. She sleeps on the computer, anything that, and she sleeps on her sister, anything that radiates heat. Well, the, that's one of the sort of, again, unusual behaviors from Mika, um, just to finish off where we started. Um, he just lies anywhere now, and he seems to be relaxed. Which is, it would just be in the middle of a room, whatever, and, or, Mirror, middle of the corridor yeah I'm just gonna lie here I'm just not right okay. <laughs> you know, he doesn't seek out warm places particularly so um, you've never had a bold cat like that before no I, I think as I said the first the first cat that Connie and I had together was a Berman who had a fantastic pedigree oh. but had all the inherited problems and the dysplastic hips and all sorts um then we had a, a couple of cats, one of uh, that came through my research. Um, you know, we do the non-invasive research and we rehome them afterwards. They were rescues, one of which had uh, was an overweight cat that um, had diabetes and I brought home to stabilize and <laughs> she never went back. Um, and the other one had dysplastic shoulders. So as I said, having a young cat that runs alone oh, space is it's, right. it's different. <laughs> See the top of my refrigerator there? Yeah. The cat that you can't, that hasn't come out, she sit, she gets up there <laughs> and she jumps from the counter up there and walks back and forth up there. She gets up on top of all sorts of high things. She gets on top of doors. Mm. She, she's this one, the other one doesn't, is not the, the jumper, yeah. but the other cat, she, Nikki, she jumps everywhere. She's up yeah. high, whatever. Yep. Yeah, no, he's, he's, he's very agile. I, the other night, last night, I just saw him dart straight across and we've got these banisters and now he's he's got really long whiskers but he just didn't hesitate he just went straight through jumped onto halfway down the stairs and I just thought now he must have shoved his head through and know how much of the deflection on his whiskers is okay because his whiskers are so much wider right. than he, he, he they know how wide their shoulders are besides their shoulder blades move yeah, but it was just it was, it was mine walking on top. Do you have a banister up high? I have a, yeah. a banister one story up. My mm. cats get a top and walk on on there. Mm. No, he's not like a whole story. That. Okay, they're <laughs> they're like both of them, and I'm like, you don't want to yell at them, but they jump up, 
and walk back and forth, turn around, walk back again, jump down. Oh. They keep us entertained. Looking. They do. I do. I don't know that I'll ever own another dog. No. No. Not a lot of work. Anyway, we'll close there. I think. We've sort of you have to cut back. that part about not, not owning another dog. I'll be pilloried by that. No, I don't think so. It's been. You a don't pleasure. have a dog. We don't. I don't have a dog, and I've, the reason why I don't have a dog is because, as I said, I travel so much, and Connie's not a right. great dog person. I don't think it's fair on a dog. You know, as much as I'd like a dog, it's not fair right. on a dog. So that's the reason why. But I have. There you go. We've got plenty of dogs at work, so when I need my dog fix, I can go there. There you go. My new neighbors here have a dog, a, a King Charles Cavalier Spaniel, that is adorable, hmm. and I see her every day. And when she sees me, she whines. So I pet her. So I get my dog fixed. It's day. like it's like grandchildren. You pass them back at the end of the day. <laughs> that's right. You can spoil. There's them only up. one thing better than grandchildren, What's that? and that's more grandchildren. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Lovely to catch up with you once again. It really is. It really is. So I, I would come to the UK to lecture for you sometime. Right. Well, as I said, whether you're lecturing or not, you're, you're well, always welcome here. Well, thank you. I am honored to be on your podcast. No, and now you know what makes me click. <laughs> the pleasure has been all mine and the honor is all mine. So lovely to see you. Take care. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If so, please remember to give us a like or subscribe. It helps more than you know. We all do these episodes for free because we hope people will take something useful from them. So giving us a like and subscribing helps others find us and related content. We have a lot more episodes for you to enjoy on our podcast platform, with videos on my YouTube channel together with other resources. Just search for What Makes You Click and Daniel Mills. Subscribing to both our Facebook group and YouTube channel not only helps in a similar way, but also means you shouldn't miss when the next episode comes out. Thanks once again, and feel free to post a comment or suggestion. Bye now.